my name is uh, Nagaraju, but uh, I go by Raju, which is easier. So feel free to stop me at any time and if you have questions. So what I am trying to do, I think, for the next uh, 30 to 45 minutes, is to just give some idea about what prednisone is, how it works, and how the side effects come and how the beneficial effects actually are mediated. Is there a way we can actually dissociate these two, the side effects and beneficial effects? So the question I have is, how many of you actually know the history of prednisone? Anybody? Okay, good. <laughs> so, before I actually go there, I, I think uh, uh, I have some disclosures. So academically, I just, I, until August end, I was at the Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. I just moved a uh, couple of days back, so officially I'm now at the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences in State University of New York in Binghamton. And also, I have the disclosures. Uh, co-founded two companies and one of the one called Riverigen Biopharma is the uh, company that is actually developing this dissociated uh, steroid. So again, I'm a immunologist, I'm a basic scientist, so this is mostly an informational uh, interactive type of a session as opposed to you know, an advice or anything. So. So going back, these are the three gentlemen who won the Nobel Prize in 1950 for the discovery that they made in 1948. So generally, Nobel Prize is given for discoveries made at least 10 to 20 years before. This is the fastest ever that anybody won the Nobel Prize for something that they found two years before. That also tells one thing, that the discovery is so profound that the committee could not resist recognizing their contributions to in identifying the glucocorticoids. So Edward Kendall is a chemist working at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, along with Philip Hent is a rheumatologist at the time. So Philip Hench had an idea that normally, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, that if you become pregnant, the disease goes away. The, once you deliver, the disease comes back. So he got this idea, hmm, what happened? What hormonal changes occur during pregnancy? It has something probably related to cortisol. At the time, it was not known as cortisol. So he actually talked to Kendall, and they used to go to uh, a slaughterhouse and collect adrenal cortex and purify extracts. And the first time this extract was given to a patient, with rheumatoid arthritis. So the story, I don't know to what extent it is correct, but uh, people say that the woman who received this particular extract of adrenal cortex extract had disease for over 15, 20 years. So, and many of you, or at least some of you may know, in arthritis, early synovitis in the morning, you know, the stiffness is a profound thing. It's very hard to put buttons or anything. After two injections, and you know, if you have a disease for 20 years, obviously you know exactly what your mornings are, how, right? So her finger started moving in the morning, and she actually asked her family members to pinch her that she's actually not dreaming. This is real. So such is the profound effect of the adrenal cortex extract at the time. So Kendall, as a chemist, 
So he, along with the Tedious Reichstein in Switzerland, they synthesize, so extracting something from cow's kidneys is hard. You know, there is no way you can produce enough quantities. So they chemically synthesized the so-called prednisone and its equivalents. And the first paper was published in 1948. The drug worked like a miracle. So the woman who received this drug, first time in 20 years at the time, she went to the mall in Minnesota, in Rochester, and she spent whole days shopping in the mall. It's a very powerful drug. So what happened then, as you all know, prednisone works in allergy, asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, you name, right? You have an itch, you put a cortisone, and then itch goes away. It's truly a miracle drug. As more and more patients started using the drug, then it became very evident it has profound side effects. You know, almost everybody who took prednisone, they know I don't have to explain. So, how come, what is that is present in this drug that works so well, but it also causes such devastating side effects. So I can actually, I just listed some of the things in terms of the side effects. And if we elaborate, they go for a couple of pages. What this tells you is, essentially, there is no organ that is spared from the side effects of prednisone. So this is every single organ, brain, liver, gut, bone, skin, eyes, mood changes, everything. I think pretty much every single organ is affected. Now the main question is why these side effects? how these side effects are actually at a molecular level are mediated. For, to understand that, we have to understand. So I'll try to generalize. I don't know. I think some of you may have science background, others not. So if you take a cell, and probably most of you know, cell has a cell membrane, and cell also has a nucleus. Do you all agree? <laughs> now, cortisol, this is the structure, let me see if I have on the top that little chemical structure that diffuses through the plasma membrane into the cytoplasm. When it goes oops, into the cytoplasm, it actually binds. See, this is the prednisone or cortisol. It binds to its receptor called glucocorticoid receptor. So once it binds to the receptor, it what we call dimerization. The two molecules, they come together and then they migrate into the nucleus. As you can see, two of them. So within the nucleus, they bind to the DNA and mediate the expression of hundreds of genes. Almost 90% of the side effects are all mediated due to this dimerization binding to this place what we call glucocorticoid response elements within the DNA. So this is what, this is how the side effects come. Now, beneficial effects. So, what I call this as dimers, and this is a monomer. Just means single receptor. So, when glucocorticoids bind to the single receptor, they actually go through the so-called anti-inflammatory pathway. So, most of the beneficial effects are due to this monomer. And also, 
This drug, because it has an ability to diffuse and insert itself into the plasma membrane, it also stabilizes the plasma membrane. So now we know all the beneficial effects are due to these three processes. Almost all the side effects are due to this particular process. Right? Is, is this clear to everybody? No. Go ahead, ask. So, so yeah, go, go ahead. Prednisone has like a lot of like icky, icky side effects, mm -hmm. and it uh, seems to attack every muscle in the body. You know, mm -hmm. like you were saying, no muscle is sparing or off limits. Right. But it's like I'm trying to figure out if there's a way or if there's a drug that way that it can like sort of kind of like block the side effects, so that you are still able to like you know be on the prednisone. Because mm -hmm. prednisone seems like in every class that you go mm -hmm. to. Prednisone is like the main drug that everyone right. uses. Right. So it's like it's kind of difficult to how it how it works and right. but and then like how it gives you like all these nasty side effects. But so what I'm trying to say is I'm trying to identify how prednisone when it enters into the cell that results into beneficial effects and side effects. So just to answer your question, let's say if I make a drug that fails to dimerize, right? That means only monomer exists. That means only good effects. So you can actually remove that. So then you have only beneficial effects. So Okay, sorry. Hopefully this is clear, right? Okay. Now, lot of things actually happen, uh, you know, very serendipitously. In 2006, I met this gentleman, John McCall, for a lunch at one of the scientific advisory board meetings for our hospital. Then I told him I'm interested to, I'm an immunologist, I'm interested to find drugs that block inflammation. He told me in 80s, he used to work on drugs that the Pfizer actually developed. Used to be the global head for medicinal chemistry at Pfizer in 1980s. And for whatever reason, Pfizer decided not to pursue the program. They're all shelved. And he is the one who actually created all those compounds. He asked me, Roger, can you test this for me? I used to work some 30 years back. Those structures still remain in my head but nobody ever pursued, Pfizer had no interest. I said, it fits very well, I would like to test. So he sent me a series of compounds. This is how a prednisone looks. And this is how this particular steroid. Can anybody tell me the difference? Where is the difference between prednisone and this VBP15? The position 11, do you see? Yeah. Right? Delta 911 position. By simply changing that, you make the drug only to bind to monomer and abolish dimerization. We get this tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I see you have prednisolone. Can you explain the difference between prednisolone and prednisone? Yeah, it's generally, I think the the. It, uh, prednisolone, so it's a, it's a metabolic s step where prednisone need to be converted into prednisolone. Otherwise, at the end when they act, then they all, both of them become prednisolone. So, yeah. 
So, <clears throat> as soon as we, I tested this, and a lot of over, I think, four years' worth of work went in to see how these drugs are different from prednisone. And then we ended up going to our hospital saying that, oh, we found a drug that we want to develop and we want to start a company. Our hospital said, very good, great idea, it's fantastic. And as long as the university owns 90% of the company. So, so three of us, we said, you know, that's not the way we want to do. So finally, we convinced our hospital to be the minority owner. And then we started this company called Riveragen Biopharma. Now, I will come back and talk about the why academic people, I say we're not business people, why we decided to start this. The main rationale, you probably now know about pharmaceutical companies exacerbating the drug costs to skyrocketing levels, pretty much exploiting suffering people. And also, until five, ten years, maybe five years back, major pharmaceutical companies developed drugs only for diseases where they have a market. There is nothing wrong. If, if you do business, you have to make money and you focus. For me, as an academic person, suffering for a famous disease and suffering for a rare disease, they're not very different. Suffering is suffering. So that means somebody truly have to work on rare diseases. Because they are not the interest of big companies. So that's the primary reason. So it's a rare disease company working on rare neuromuscular diseases. So what is the goal of this company? Goal is, as you can see, this is an onion with a bad part. Can we peel off different layers so that we can keep the good layers and throw away the... That's the concept as I showed before. So the goal is to keep or enhance or add efficacy, that is the beneficial effects, and also remove, reduce, safety issues. Now, when we do this in the lab, you know, we start with the cell culture experiment <clears throat> where we grow the cells, test the mechanisms, the stuff that I showed in the previous, whether it is going into the nucleus, where it is binding, all those experiments were done, published. But in reality, you know, this drug has never been in people. You simply cannot directly go to people. You have to do some mouse experiments to show it actually works in a living organism. So this is what the experiment that we did. So this is a model for another muscle disease called muscular dystrophy. But there are similarities in terms of the inflammation, everything. So what we did, we take mice, 15 mice for each group. It's like human clinical trial. You give, you keep some mice, just only give syrup. The other mice, 5 milligrams, 15 milligrams, 30 milligrams. And then use prednisone as a control. Then you'll be able to tell this drug is better in comparison to prednisone. So mice like children, they like syrup. All that you have to do is put something at it. They take it easily. You treat them for six weeks and then look at what happens to their inflammation, what happens to their strength. Look at all the phenotypes. Just give you this. So mice actually you can make them to, there is a, you know, uh, what we call grip strength meters. Small grid, you can make them to hold and pull the tail 
and the machine records how much force. Right? So when you do that, normal mice have generated this much force. Whereas the mice with the disease, they're weak. They generate very little force. And then when you treat with this drug, 5, 15, and 30 milligrams, force goes up. And as I also said, prednisone works. So that means this drug has similar beneficial properties as prednisone. Now, see the problem with mice is that, let's say the mice decides not to hold the grid. There is virtually nothing you and I can do. So then what we have to do, some of these experiments, in order to take away the evolutional effect, after you euthanize the mice, you take the muscle out, you actually see how much force they generate by doing the physiology experiments. So you can actually see, if you do that, these drugs increase the force. And also I mentioned, it's an inflammatory disease. What happens to the inflammation? So this is an imaging technique where, you know, you can put a live mice, anesthetize them, and then you can image their legs, both forelimbs and hind limbs. So this is how the red means lot of inflammation. In comparison to the normal mice, you can see lot of red. But if you treat with this drug, it goes down. And prednisone also reduces inflammation, you can see. So that means this drug works like prednisone in terms of red increasing force, reducing inflammation in the muscle. Now, as I said, the prednisone is extremely deleterious even to mice. If you treat mice with prednisone, see they are small. Mice. If you give to the children, they have a stunted growth. You can see the body, you can see the body length. With prednisone, the length decreases. So here is the prednisone mice. See the length of the VBP treated mice and the length of the normal mice. They're tiny. <coughs> now go back and look at their bones. Prednisone treated the length of the bones, shorten. Then if you carefully look at the corners of the bone, you can see they are so thin here in comparison to normal. What does this mean? That means we got rid of side effects on the bone. So, just to, I want to just summarize so that we can talk a little more. There, there is, this is real, little more than 10 years worth of work. There is, I don't want to bore you. <laughs> so, simply, but with this drug, what we did is, we showed in mice, you can improve the force, you can reduce the inflammation, and we can reduce the muscle damage. It has no effect on the body weight, muscle length, bone length, and fibrosis, and also it's not, no detrimental effect on the immune system. Then, oh, it's well and good, you can show a lot of things in mice, does it really work in people? So, but unfortunately what happens, since this drug has never been in people, FDA will ask you to check whether the drug is safe. Whether it works or not is not the first step. First step is whether it is safe. So those experiments, the normal human trials in normal healthy individuals, were completed, and I just want to show you one thing. So, 
As you all know, one of the side effects of prednisone is hyperglycemia, right? So if you look at this drug, the VBP-15, at 1 milligram, 3 milligrams, 9 milligram, and 20 milligrams, and this is the, the blue one is the placebo untreated. There is no difference. Whereas if it is prednisone, and suddenly everything goes up. So we, even in people, in normal individuals, the beneficial, the side effects profiles are completely gone. There is no way we can test the beneficial effects in normal because they have no problems. So the phase two clinical trials, so, <clears throat> so this is not, so the clinical trial program as of now that is going on, that, that's not in myositis patients, but that is in children with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy where prednisone is the standard of care and there is no approved drug for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and this is a devastating disease that I don't know how many of you know about Duchenne's muscular dystrophy? All of you? So it's the disease due to the absence of a gene called dystrophin children often are diagnosed between the ages of two and four that they have difficulty in raising up, walking, climbing stairs. So by nine to ten years, 100% of them are wheelchair bound. By early 20s, 100% mortality. It's a devastating disease, not only for the patients, it's a devastating disease for parents. Children often, they come to know that they have disease only, you know, when they have problems. That is often by six, seven, eight years. Parents start suffering from the day of diagnosis and suffer long after children gone. So it's a terrible disease. That's one of the reasons why we wanted to first try this drug in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So we are now in June 2016, phase 2A study started. So phase 2A is, again, we know now this drug is safe in adult normal individuals. But we also, so children are not small adults. They are very different. As I said that the prednisone stunts bone, muscle, everything. So we need to make sure it is safe even in children first. That is what the safety phase 2A trial, which is currently underway. So later part of this, this year, we're going to start phase 2B. That is where we will come to know that the drug really works in a disease condition in human <coughs> patients. It's a long, lengthy process, but we're, we're there. But again, it is a trial. So these are clinical trials. There is no guarantee. We can only rationalize and move forward, but there is virtually no guarantee. So now, how do we test the drug it really works? So we do something called as a six-minute walk test, stair climb test, so the children before treatment, after treatment, you do these assessments and then you evaluate in a blinded way whether the drug really works. Now, I just want to talk about something I just referred to. So when we started this program, and obviously this drug works not only for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy or myositis, it will work wherever prednisone works. That means there is a lot of demand. That means there are a lot of big companies interested to purchase this program. So, but until now, who funded the pro program? Mostly, almost 100% of funding came 
from innumerable number of parent foundations and some of the government programs. So one of the beauty of writing grants for every single step is that somebody is evaluating what you are doing is correct or not. If you can convince them, then they will give you the money, you make an extra. Of course, it's a very arduous process because you are continuously struggling for money. But overall, our fear was if somebody else gives money, they obviously want to take this program for a disease that makes a lot of money, then all our efforts will go away. So that is the reason why what we call venture philanthropy model, not a venture capitalist model. Venture capitalists, when they give them, there is nothing wrong, it's a business. So I'm just saying it simply doesn't work for the mission, the reason why we started the whole thing in the first place. That is to take care of rare disease patients. So I'll stop here and there are quite a few. It's, it's, Foundations all over the world, U US, UK, Australia, significantly contributed for almost last 10 years for the development of this program. So I will take questions, comments, hopefully I haven't confused you. Before you got the humans, it's a, so. The, we started this in 2007. Yeah, five, probably five years. But this now we still test in the mouse models for asthma, arthritis, multiple sclerosis. Yes. Clinical studies in the young boys. Correct. Um, from there, if things are positive. Yes. What is the next step? Very good. So the next step is, so there are two. Uh, so normally, we go back and explain the drug approval process a little bit. I think some of you already know, some probably not. There are three phases of clinical trials. The first phase is phase one safety. Second phase is phase two efficacy. Third phase is using the drug in larger populations to see whether you can reproduce the safe efficacy that you saw in a phase two trial. But the problem for rare diseases, you will never get to have lots, thousands of patients. There is no way you can do a phase three trial for a rare disease. So what FDA said now, we will approve the drug in phase two, but we'll still monitor when you market the drug to the patients. And then after five years, six years, when large number of patients are treated, we'll reevaluate. So that means if this drug works, it will get approved in phase two, that gets approved, then it can be used for any disease, even though company cannot advertise, saying that we cannot say it will work in myositis, whereas the doctor can prescribe. In prednisone, for example, it's never approved by FDA. Today, if prednisone goes to FDA approval, it will never pass because of the bad effects. Um, I don't really have a question. I just want to say that from the perspective of a patient who is uh, refractory and I cannot get my prednisone lower than 30 milligrams a day, thank you. Thank you. curious as to after the damage that prednisone has caused and 
we're now at a point, and I'm just doing this figuratively, at where this medication is available, does it solve some of those uh, negative effects or you, the medicine starts to perform at where you are at that point? I think most probably, depend, again, depends on the extent of the damage. If it is in the early phases, probably it's okay, but the damage is quite extensive. I don't think this drug will reverse anything because it simply doesn't have side effects. But it will still work well for the disease itself, but not damage caused by the prednisone. That's how I think. But. Uh, Okay, what I was simply going to ask is, okay, so if you go to, who like, who should you ask? Like, should you talk to your neurologist? Should you talk to your rheumatologist? Should you talk to your primary care physician, your endocrinologist? Like, who is it that you can ask, um, how do you get your hands on this? Um, is it a pill or is it a vaccine? So, so it is going to be a oral pill, but again, if you ask today, the drug is not approved, it is not in the market. <laughs> so it's not in the market, so the only way to have access is through the clinical trial, am I right? And you're not at the clinical trial point where it involves uh, humans, am I understanding? We are, we are doing clinical trials in children with the DMD. Right. Only children with the Duchenne's muscular dystrophy are enrolled in this trial, no other disease. And so do you have scheduled a point in time when you're going to have adults uh, with, mm -hmm. with neuro, neuromuscular disease? Yes. So once we get the approval, then, then immediately we'll, I think that's my, as I said, for 20 years, my focus has been on my site. That's the topmost priority for me personally. And so that means after five years from now and then, or looking at... No, I think it's a, the trials, if, if the, say, let's say, the, we, we, there are two scenarios, right? Scenario number one, drug works. 2017, we'll get an approval. Then 2017, you can start trial because the drug is safe. The second scenario is drug doesn't work in children, right? That doesn't mean it doesn't work in adults with myositis. That means you have to redesign a trial. So that's how the process is. Is this a trial in other countries? Yeah, no. Uh, the, the, the issue, I think, uh, is uh, it is, for some reason, it is good to follow the rules. Uh, because some of the drugs, you know, we don't want to take unsafe drugs. So we haven't tried to, and also it is very hard to market drugs that were clinical trials done in places that are not approved by FDA or the European Medical Agency. Thank you. I'm good presentation. I'm interested to know um, who pays to be on the trials. Does the patient pay money? Does the drug company pay money? Does the government support you? Do the doctors stick their hands in their pockets? Um, does foundations have to put money up? How do you actually manage the money to put forward? a drug trial, and who chases that money? Yes. So currently, so we, write, we wrote grants to FDA, National Institutes of Health, Food and Drug Administration, as well as to European Commission. All three agencies funded this program to do the trials. So no patient will be charged because we are receiving money to do the trial for the duration of the trial. So the idea is, again, I'm an academic person, so we 
once we reach a stage where we achieve our goal of approving this drug for the rare disease, obviously somebody else will purchase this to do more programs. Could I ask further, if a child is on this program, where are they measured for their compliance to the drug and the, um, how they are going on that drug with the objective tools you use for measurement to see if the drug is working? Do right. they have to travel? Do they have... I don't know what right. So they, they, so we have identified the so-called hospitals, clinical trial sites, where you have neurologists seeing these patients, and they are uh, clinical trial evaluators. So they are the ones who assess these children and record the data under the control of the committee in an FDA approved uh, process. Because we have to first submit, this is how we are going to do this trial in children to FDA. If, when FDA gives permission, then we simply follow that protocol and they monitor everything. Okay, now, <clears throat> I gotta try to understand this like a two year old. Okay? <laughs> because we all know the side effects of prednisone yeah. and the amount of side effects from the prednisone and we also know that IVIG has helped a lot of people with the disease of myositis. Yes. But because of the fact that it's not FDA approved, the insurance companies won't approve it. But we also got to realize that prednisone is a lot cheaper yes. in, the money, in the dollar signs than the IVIG. IVIG, yes. But when you look at all the side effects that that person is going to have and going to develop mm -hmm. later on in his life, mm -hmm. and the insurance company is still going to have to cover them for it. Yes. You know, it just doesn't make sense that, you know, you let them, it's almost as if they let them take the prednisone until, and hopefully you'll die, and we don't have to worry about it anymore, or if you do live, you're going to have 25 other diseases mm -hmm. that we're going to have to cover you for. Mm -hmm. So it does, doesn't make any sense why they don't just approve the IVIG because there's less side effects on it than there is on the prednisone. I mean, if it, I, I started off with a doctor that all he gave me was prednisone. That's, that was it. I was up to 120 milligrams in prednisone, and I weighed over 104 pounds <laughs> until I actually got out of that doctor because you have to find a doctor that's going to fight for you. Okay? Right. I went right. to another doctor, which was Dr. Lang in the Hospital for Special Surgeries in New York, and he fought with the insurance company. You know, and it wasn't until I wound up in the hospital, you know, because I couldn't walk anymore, and they started administrating the IVIG on me, where the insurance had no choice but to approve it and start covering it. But that's what it takes, because it just, you know, in the long run, with all the side effects that you're going to get with prednisone, wouldn't it cost the insurance more money to cover all those side effects? No, I fully agree with you. There is, a, there is no disagreement here. I just don't understand. I just don't understand. Yeah. yeah. That is because the insurance companies have no long-term interest. Once you reach retirement age, where do you shift to for your medical care? Medicaid. Medicaid. Yeah. Or rather, Medicaid. Or you die. Medicaid. So the insurance companies have no long-term in interest in treating you. Right. Once you get to that point, it's not their problem. Yeah. Yes, I have a question. Sure. Um, so, if this um, other le less drug like prednisone yes. is approved in muscular dystrophy pain children, and it works in them, so it's approved by FDA. Yes. I have two questions. Okay, how long is it before it is manufactured? Like, are you? Is, you're talking about this company is a drug company that's going to make the drug for mm -hmm. distribution. Yeah. And I understand that a lot of drugs are given off-label once they're approved by FDA. That's correct. So once it's approved by FDA and you have manufactured the drug, yes. it could be given off-label to myositis patients. That's correct. correct. How, what kind of timeline are you looking at if it's approved through this study? Probably 2018, I believe, if everything goes well. 
it kind of goes along with that. So I, I hope it is, works. And it's we, like, we hope. We really hope it does. If it doesn't, and then you shift over and you have to do uh, clinical trials mm -hmm. and you choose a particular disease, disease yes. um, then what is the timeline for that from doing the so, trials, right. clinical trials, and everything else. That's correct. So because in adults, see, both we already did the phase one, that means it is safe. Mm -hmm. So all that we have to do is a phase two trial mm -hmm. in whichever disease. Let's say we take my scientist. Mm -hmm. So the way it works is for we need to know the natural history of the disease. Let's say if you don't treat a patient for six months, this is the progression. That means you design a trial for six months so that either the progression can be this progression can be you know, improvement. So whereas the end points, that's what we call. If it takes to see this slope one year, then you have to do one year in order to get the statistical. So that needs to be determined based on the, what disease it is, what end points, but mostly in my mind, probably a trial of at least a year, six months to. I don't know how many of you are fairly new to this. I've had GM for 30 years before there was a myositis association. And then when the myositis association came to be, I became part of it. We had nothing. We had nothing. And I just want to say thank you because I am so moved to tears by what you have done for us since then. And we're so fortunate to be here, and we're so fortunate to have you. I have no questions. I just want to say thank you. <laughs> thank you. A question in the statement, and the question would be, when you start the, the clinical trials for adults, am I to assume that through maybe through the association or through clinicaltrials.com or whatever it is, that there's going to be a posting looking That's for it. Okay. Yes. And that could happen actually at, one of the, at the next convention or the convention. That's correct. Okay. And, and I'm a new guy, so I just got diagnosed in February. I got sick in November. I got a diagnosis quickly. So this is, you know, certainly gives some hope and, uh, and, and to be and to be safe to everybody. I'm so thankful that people are willing to talk about the disease and the experience. Uh, I had no clue, no idea, scared as hell, um, didn't know what to expect, didn't, had never met a person that had, uh, and I have been, uh, had not met anybody until I walked in the room uh, on Thursday, and then I saw a bunch of people that I shared this experience with. And, um, you know, it's certainly uh, helpful and thankful to see you alive and that uh, there's some hope for you. <laughs> no, I think the credit I have to give to my CITES Association because some of my research funded by my CITES Association. So, and it, it's a... The, you saw the group of people this morning sitting, extremely dedicated group of physicians, scientists, and physician scientists who are truly committed to this cause of finding and making a difference for this group of diseases. I guess we all know that prednisone is a pretty inexpensive uh, drug, so yes. we're hoping that this also would uh, yes. kind of be a reasonable drug. I'm just curious, uh, you indicated that it was uh, Pfizer Pharmaceutical that kind of initiated the model and didn't have any interest in it, but has all the uh, legal issues been addressed yes. so that they couldn't come back and, uh, oh, no, the, the that yeah, so the, the, no, the, the patent issues are all settled, there are no, because the, the what happened was Dr. McCall, in, he actually when he was a Pfizer employee, at the time he had the patent. So we applied once, because none of these properties that we found, they, they were never known at the time, nobody ever. So these are all new things that we discovered while studying this drug. So we have 
intellectual property and each of those properties that I described. So that's, I think it's okay, but uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. One of the things that you studies and Yes, so this is the, I showed you the website, it is Riverigen Biopharma, we will update this, this is the site. So riverigen.com, www.riverigen.com. I'm sorry, we take this on a little bit of a tangent. Sure, sure. I, I've been, I'm recently diagnosed and I've been on prednisone for seven and a half weeks. And I don't want to push my luck, but I feel great. When do the terrible side effects start? <laughs> <laughs> it varies from people to people. It also varies from the dose. So it's after the tapering and flares and then it starts happening? Or? No. Like for me, I'm on prednisone for seven and a half weeks. And then I except insomnia, and I've managed by taking really good care of myself with an anti-inflammatory nutrition lifestyle for the most part. I realize everybody's different, but if you can tolerate alternate day therapy, some people can, some people can't, but you, we tend not to see the side effects with alternate day therapy. So like five milligrams every day is going to be worse probably than 20 every other day, and the data bears that. That's correct. But I can give you hope. You can... We had nothing but the steroids back then, and I've taken mega doses, and I never got a moon phase. I just, but I take very good care of myself, and then everybody metabolizes differently. Different, yep. Yeah. But this is 30 years, and I'm still here. I'm, okay. I'm still on it, but not much, and I've been off it and back on it. But it saved my life. <laughs> when I get weak. <laughs> when I start having clinical symptoms. But I have really been able... I'm in psychology, I have graduate degrees, and I, I don't know if you my class, I got an anti-inflammatory diet, and mindfulness, compassion has changed my life. So, I just, I hate to keep getting the microphone, but I feel like I need to tell you from 30 years. Okay? So, I am monitored for everything, my bones are good, my eyes are good. I'm telling you, the only side effect I have is insomnia. And then that's only about every other day when I take the drug. But I've never taken it every day. I'm one of those we started every other day with big, massive doses. And even at that big, massive dose every other day, I didn't have side effects. Mine, mine was every day. See, so, you know, but everybody's different. We metabolize right, exactly. differently. Exactly, yeah. Here's another aspect. Hey, I'm really excited about this, so I'm having fantasies. Um, I... Uh, I had to stop prednisone two years ago after four years, it just could not hang. Um, so can you promise me that this won't make us gain weight? <laughs> that would be my first question. My second question, I totally understand, like you did a great job of explaining about the cells in the beginning and how you remove the side effects and here's the beneficial effects. So at what, at what point will you be able to determine the side effects that it will possibly have? Yes, so we know that in the phase one trial that, that is primarily meant for looking at when you give at large doses. So the doses that we have given is 20 milligrams per kg. You will never give prednisone. So if that doesn't cause any side effects, 
you reasonably assume there is no guarantee because these are, if you take lifelong as you just heard for 30 years, there is no way to know. These are trials done for a short time. We may learn, yes, after 20 years, if you take, you will have some of the side effects of prednisone. There is no way for us to know. Okay, any more questions? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> the primary benefit then in this clinical trial for the uh, little ones is uh, to decrease inflammation. Are there any other benefits that you have seen? So the way, uh, you know, the you know, we, we haven't finished the trial in the benefits trial yet. So that's still going on. But we are going to measure in six minutes how much distance they walk. And then we will also ask them to claim stairs and how fast they claim stairs. And also, they have a problem. I think these children, they have what is called as when they have to get up, they have to actually take hand support to get up. So we measure a several of those parameters and then conclude whether the drug is affecting those parameters. Then, so the, the other long-term uh, treatment, long-term effects is you can monitor, see for example, normally an untreated child goes to wheelchair by between nine and 11. This drug prolongs by 10, 20, 15 years. So, but that experiment cannot be done until it is you know, marketed. Oh, okay. No, no question is crazy. <laughs> yes, if once the FDA gets approved. Okay. Huh? Yeah, I don't know the marketing aspects of it, so I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the companies, they will figure out how to sell the drug. <laughs> Question? Yes. And it may be, your answer may be, it's too early to answer. When we get to adult trials, do you anticipate those trials excluding people who are on certain other treatments, for example? Are you, have you been on IVIG? Have you been on rituximab? Have you been on cell set? Things like that. Or, or is it too early yet to know? I think it is too early because it, the, the way, you know, in a double-blinded trial, Often, people generally, they are put on the maintenance dose of the drugs, both the treated and untreated, but that is again determined by the clinical trial plan. So right now, you know, it's very hard to say. Will you divide by age and sex and region? And Probably, if we go to uh, my aside is I don't think we will divide whereas in inducens muscular dystrophy it's an excellent disease only male children are affected so it's all done in boys are you still are you still going to take you wrote the drug are you still going to take the other drug and also this drug, or this is going to be the one that's going to substitute for all the other drugs, or, is, or you can't. No, I, no, we, no we, we are not going to give this drug with prednisone because we want to replace prednisone. Right. Oh, this is really going to replace prednisone, but you still may have to take your other drugs. It, we, we don't know that because, right. Because we know 
prednisone, if you don't have side effects, it works. Yes, that's correct. And it worked very well. Yeah, what is prednisone? But it's just a stress hormone cortisol. A more powerful, five times more powerful than cortisol. That's all it is. It's a chemical form of our stress hormone. It's more potent. Yeah, I, I don't want to seem negative, but prednisone actually is beneficial to Pfizer with all the side effects because then they can sell other drugs. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. It's really wonderful interacting with all of you.